Uh, we'll now hear from Mike Perry. Uh, Mike has been active in transhumanist-related work since the 1970s and has worked at Alcor Foundation, which is a leading cryonics organization, uh, since... 1987. He's written a book, Forever for All, about the possibilities of attaining immortality and resurrection of the dead through scientific means. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Colorado and is currently exploring mathematical approaches to the problems of personal identity and resurrection. Okay, can everybody hear me? <laughs> well, I'm going to be talking about the possibility of... Okay. Okay, okay. okay. Is that all right? Can you hear me? I'm going to be talking about the possibility of resurrecting the dead uh, through technology, and I hope everybody is, will find it interesting, whatever your theological... Uh, orientation or whatever you think about cosmology or whatever. And uh, this idea uh, goes back a long ways. It's nothing particularly original. The uh, Russian philosopher Nikolai Fyodorov uh, uh, developed a theory of resurrection in the 19th century based on uh, his understanding of, of physics at the time. And he uh, imagined the Newtonian universe and the uh, thought that uh, just as you could uh, map the, um, the motion of, of uh, planets and uh, retrodict ancient uh, solar eclipses and so on, if you could, in the future, we should be able to track the motions of individual atoms and uh, to arbitrary accuracy, and uh, thereby we could uh, determine their positions 500 years ago, and uh, in that manner we could... Uh, put the atoms back in the right places for the people that were living back then so we could resurrect these people. And uh, anyhow, um, the uh, advent of uh, quantum mechanics with its uncertainty principle uh, seems to throw a lot of cold water on that idea. It doesn't look like uh, you could actually uh, do such a, a mapping that would allow you to retrodict history. Um, there are those who, who have come up with something they call quantum archaeology, which uh, in effect seems to be saying, well, maybe you can do that after all. And maybe you can get back every bit of information and position of every atom in history. And you could just put those atoms back in the right places and get back the people. Or if you didn't want to mess around with individual atoms, you might just work with information and maybe you could upload the people into the right uh, future uh, computational devices so they could resume their consciousness that way. Well, anyway, I uh, happen to be a skeptic of, of that sort of possibility, and uh, I will also include things like the idea that we might be in a computer simulation in which the states of computation have already been saved by the supreme programmer in such a way that you could get back all the data you need that way. And uh, I would like to talk about another possibility entirely from all of that that I call parallel recreation. And uh, it says, in effect, that, you know, you just have to put up with some loss of information and you, you can't get it back in any straightforward sense. And yet I still claim that in, in some reasonable sense you could resurrect the dead. And by resurrecting the dead... I'm really talking mainly about, in the first place, getting a description of each person down to the, you know, down to the level of brain structure and so on. So it's mainly, as I see it, an informational problem. And uh, once you have the information, uh, you know, some people worry about whether if you if you use that to construct a body and that body was a, a copy of the original but not the original, does that matter? From my point of view, it doesn't matter. So suspend your disbelief a little bit if it matters to you. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, as I've said, quantum archaeology would 
sort of cut the Gordian knot, but uh-oh, what did I do? Did I turn it off? Okay, here we go. Yeah. So basically, what what do you do? If you can't get back that information, what are you going to do? And, uh, well, in a sense, you will get it back. But uh, the answer to really whether you can do it or not depends on your worldview. And I want to I want to introduce a certain idea that I think that uh, reality, in my view, is underdetermined. What does that mean? Um, it really means that that more. Well, let me just jump to something else first, and then I'll get back to to the reality thing. Uh, a certain important property for this resurrection idea is the multiverse. So I'm assuming there are multiple universes, and these multiple universes cover all the possibilities. So there are universes where there are people just like you folks with somebody just like me standing here, among all the many other possibilities and essentially infinitely many of all of that. So that turns out to be useful to rationalize the approach I'm going to describe. And in, in, this, uh, in the multiverse, I assume that all finite histories happen over and over in, in all their variations. And that word finite is, in, is highlighted uh, because it does make a difference. Some people raise objections about if you're going to talk about infinite histories, you might not have enough worlds to cover all the possibilities. So we're all we need is finite histories. Maybe that's too minor a point for most of you to bring it up. But anyway, uh, it should be the case that in all these multiple universes, you get all the variations of the finite histories. So, uh, you know, there are histories just like ours, as far as we know, and other histories where certain battles were won by the opposition or somebody else other than what our books say, who our books say won the battles, and other histories where the human race didn't evolve, but an intelligent race of birds evolved on planet Earth, and you can go on from there. So there's lots of variations out there. And like I say, under determinism, More than one theory fits the facts, so the theory I'm going to present is not the only possible theory of reality, and I'm not claiming that all of them allow for resurrection. All I'm saying is that the one I offer, I think, will fit observations. At least uh, I don't think it can yet be overturned scientifically, and actually I don't think it ever will be. And as an example of what I'm talking about, that actually there's some important questions that can't be resolved by a unique theory that fits the facts. I'll just say, uh, consider whether whether a person survives sleep or not. When you wake up, is it really you or a copy of you? Is continuity of consciousness, uh, is that a requirement really to have the same person? Well, it depends on how you want to define a person. That's all it is. You can define a person where, in such a way that it really is a requirement. And so you're just dead if you so much as doze off. I, that's not the way I like to look at it myself, though. And uh, in fact, uh, it goes to show you that you can choose the theory you like to a certain extent, and you might even say reality is malleable to a certain extent. Okay, so thinking like that, I've already been through this. What what kind of a uh, uh, an outlook on reality would I want to use for allow, uh, arguing that resurrections are possible? Uh, roughly speaking, I I call it informational realism. I'm not really prepared to argue this at length today, but um, information is what is really there, and even solid matter could be seen as uh, a sort of a, a virtual effect if you want to push things far enough. So that actually has some interesting consequences, and I, I've 
already uh, introduced the idea of the multiverse and saying that there are copies of you and me, at least I think so, all distributed around reality as a whole. So you say, well, I wonder which one of those I am. And am I, where is here? And what I would say is, well, using informational, using an informational point of view, it doesn't really make sense to say where you are. We're neither here nor there. We're, we're, we are every place that exact copies of us are found. We're distributed all over all these copies. And, uh, and one, one other thing to say is that where you are distributed is not exactly where I'm distributed. So if I look at you, I can only, I can see your face, but I can't see what's behind that face. And so I'm distributed everywhere that I see a face that looks just like that one. But all those faces can have different things behind them. So the, in other words, a person might have different memories and so forth, but I can't detect that. So my, my instantiations are distributed wherever I would see everything that looks just like what I'm seeing. But yours are going to be different. You'll see every guy that looks like me, but it won't be the same. All those guys won't have the same thoughts in their head either. That's that's a, an important point for some. For you know, I'll get to it later. Okay. Okay. So how are we going to do resurrection? We will. We will. I, will, I propose that we do informed yes work. We we. Uh, we want to recreate people that we can think of as historical people. So the people we create should not uh, have uh, memories and such that contradict our historical records. Every person we create should be consistent with all the records. But if we limited ourselves just to that, just to the minimal, uh, the minimal fill-in of information in somebody's brain, it would fit the records, we would leave out way too much to reasonably say we resurrected people because, you know, a few hundred years back, there are probably many people that aren't, aren't even found in any records. And maybe you could find a, a DNA fragment or something. So you aren't really going to resurrect people like that. And so uh, it is necessary, it would be necessary to fill in extra information. And... What I would say is that um, uh, you could make different choices, but you would, of course, to, if, I would imagine doing a resurrection project, a whole, wow, I use up a lot of my time. Do a whole project like Fyodor imagined. So a lot of people would have mutually consistent memories, but you would create a timeline cohort that way. And... Uh, one possible resurrection, one possible timeline cohort. And you might uh, specially bond with that. But I wouldn't say that you couldn't do others, but that one would actually be an authentic resurrection of people that actually live. And uh, I'm going to have to, I was going to demonstrate a coin toss, but I'm out of time right now. But you, you know, you toss a coin and uh, and cover and erase the information before you look at it, and you can toss it again. And in some sense, you get back that information because you, you've actually got two possibilities. But throughout the multiverse, both of those possibilities pop up again. All right. So anyway, there's a couple of people I especially want to resurrect. Are my parents? That's a wedding picture from 1946. And, well, you'd have very many bits to resurrect, but you fill in information that fits all the surviving records. And uh, what you get is a version of them that's authentic. And it's not, a, it's not a version where they're way over here and I'm way over here, because remember, we're neither here nor there. So I think that's probably the best you could do unless there really is something like quantum archaeology or a supreme programmer or something like that. So. Uh, if those things happen, fine. You don't have to worry as much. But even if they don't, there's something else you, you have to go on. And, 
I could make the point. Have I got time? I think that to create this uh, uh, timeline cohort of, of everybody who ever lived in one version would, for the information storage, it would take nothing worse than a nine mile wide asteroid sized object to hold all the information. So it should be feasible in the future. <laughs> one last point of, one last point to make is, I'm a cryonicist and uh, I'm hoping that I won't even have to go through this resurrection. I see this as a backstop, but I also think that if you can choose cryonics and you come back earlier, you can do more good and you can help with the resurrection rather than just being a beneficiary of it. It's better to be a benefactor than just a beneficiary. So think about that. Looks like I've got 15 seconds. Thank you.